Norman Grands, one of the true unheralded legends of this music, an enigma, a leader, a hero, a heel. There's no question that Norman Grands' legacy as part of this jazz story is unrivaled in the jazz circle and community. Grands brought a lot to this music and did a lot to bring together the various camps that would have separated this music even further than it already was. Norman attended UCLA in Los Angeles, the city that he was born in 34 years ago at the time of this writing. His first sessions were presented before his army service and continued upon his release. Out of these original efforts, the now world-famous jazz of the Philharmonic series. Norman Grants has always believed a man should be judged by himself alone and not on what church he attends or what he looks like. From the start, the JATP has been an interracial organization with the artists selected for their abilities as musicians alone. There are no color or racial lines in this group, and there never have been. A man's music speaks for itself. The National Negro Publishers Association took cognizance of this in 1949 and presented Norman Grands with the Russ Warm Award for his contributions to race relations. So we're going to talk about Norman Grands today and the, the jazz of the Philharmonic. And I got my good friend Jean-Michel to contribute some stories that we're going to interspersed into this episode. I'll probably split it into two parts. We've got a lot of details and stuff to talk about here. The legacy of the jazz of the Philharmonic is so important to the jazz narrative and yet to today's collectors it's kind of under the radar and forgotten to a lot of degrees and it's really a who's who of that post-war jazz scene. He didn't shy away from anyone of race, any genre of jazz. He brought in Dixieland guys. He brought in the swing guys. He brought in bebop guys. He brought in black and white guys. He, uh, of course, on McGrath's recorded the great uh, Toshiko Akiyoshi later on, the Japanese pianist. He had no regard for race, religion, or those aspects of divide. His approach was, can you play? And is it going to be marketable? He was a very savvy businessman that comes across clear in all the things that are written about him. He was a kind of a business first sensibility and he was a practical guy, but <clears throat> he had his detractors and he had his protractors. People loved him, respected him, but there was also those who were pretty uh, at the end of their rope with him at times, including the great Ella Fitzgerald, who Jean-Michel will explain for us later on. He comes out of the service after the war. He's in Los Angeles, kind of hungry to make a mark, but he doesn't really have the capital to do much or the connections to do much. And rather boldly, foolishly on the parts of many, he decides to start a concert series with 300 borrowed dollars. And I think only one of the concert flyers remains from that original concert in 44. It becomes documented on this record how high the moon jazz of the Philharmonic. And as Jean-Michel will tell you later, it originally had a different name. It was like uh, jazz of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Uh, it was a different, a longer name, but the printing press shortened it to JTP, which is what it became going forward. And of course, the great David Stone Martin does most of the covers on most of these records. I don't think he actually does that one, but uh, it's quite a legacy and a relationship between the musicians and Norman, David Stone Martin, Ella Fitzgerald. Uh, they, he was bringing jazz to the country that he thought the country needed. And what ends up happening is this crossbreeding of genres and races and styles helps to bring about the new small era in jazz and small groups. And this integration is really creating much of what we think of as a modern sound of jazz. 
Jazz of the Philharmonic was a big contributor to that development. We don't really remember that bebop was pretty much strictly a 40s thing. It goes into the 50s, but it's already starting to evolve and change. Modern cool is coming out of that. West Coast bop. All these different things were happening. <clears throat> but the modern sound of the small group, which was somewhat dictated by economics at the time, JATP was a huge part of that development. And he really was savvy with what, how he did all these things. He promotes and brings the greatest names in jazz to the world. Uh, what made Norman Grant's uh, fabulous? It was in many fields, but uh, he, he knew how to promote his concert. He knew how to promote his artist with uh, some wonderful programs with 20, 25 pages with big photos, articles, discography. And, uh, and, and, and on top of that, he knew how to distribute all his albums all around the world. He was the very best in those days. Um, my father, you know, who just died a couple of weeks ago, he first bought his albums in 1953 and he lived in, uh, in France. And uh, since when he came to F Switzerland, because he married my mother, who was Swiss, that was the same problem, he told me. He said, man, you couldn't find the Blue Note, you couldn't find the Prestige, you couldn't find anything. You had to, you, you had to have a, a, a contact in, 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 in the United States or different contacts to order uh, what you want. And he said, most of the time, half that you order, you couldn't have because they had not enough stock, you know. But in contrary, all the albums of Norman Grant, Clef, Norgrand, Verve, you could find all of them everywhere in the world. Switzerland, France, Germany, Italy, um, even in Hungary, you know. You, 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 you could find all of them. That's why, that's why that made him so popular and all the musicians so popular too. Uh, so that was one of the reasons that it was, uh, again, fantastic. And initially, he doesn't even have his own record label to promote these concerts. <clears throat> he knows a fellow by the name of Moses Ash, who runs a label that does uh, spoken word and folk. And I think he did a bunch of Woody Guthrie stuff, if I remember. And he licenses early recordings of the JTP to this Ash label. It also had a disc label and a Stinson imprint. They were all part of the same grouping. And remember, we're talking the late 40s. This was all on 78. So all the early JTP stuff is originally on 78 format. And then he starts Clef in 46 or so. But it's still a very small enterprise. So he starts licensing the JTP stuff and other recordings he's doing to Mercury Records out of Chicago and St. Louis where they have a second record plant and Mercury has great distribution and they're fast becoming a pretty major player in the industry but he somehow retains the rights to it, he leases it, he doesn't sell it which was a clever thing on his part he ends up starting a second label Norgrand to issue more of the musicians that he's recording on these concert tours and Unfortunately, <clears throat> many of these tours have many more people performing than the records allow for. Uh, the records, like, again, were initially were 78, so you have a song or two on each release. A lot of these songs are long kind of jam formats, which was part of what Grands was trying to get across, was the power of the jam session, the power of the blues. And that's what stirred him, that's what moved him. And he often said there was more freedom in the blues than all that other stuff that I have talk, often talk about, the composition and all that. He wanted to have these guys playing free and loose and not even know when they were being recorded, which is something he mentions in a lot of these liner notes. These guys don't know when we're recording them. And he ends up slowly signing to his label Clef and to Norgrand later the artists as they become available. And so he can't put on the records 
artists that are under contract somewhere else. And so he slowly has to use the more anonymous names for some of these concerts. <clears throat> but as his reputation grows and as the series grows and as people become available, he's buying out contracts and, and adding them to his Clef Norgrand roster, which of course becomes Verve. And by the time Verve comes around, he's housed most of the greats of the swing era, some of the Dixieland guys, a lot of the Bebop guys, Parker and Gillespie. He's, he's just got this incredible roster. And of course, Ella Fitzgerald was the real cool. He wanted Ella Fitzgerald pretty badly. She was under contract with Decca. So let's talk again about his relationship with Ella Fitzgerald and the challenges that existed between the two of them over the years and the fact that she was married to Ray Brown and how that factored into all of this as well. Uh, back in 1946, 1947, uh, when Norman began to do this tour, uh, he managed a lot Billy Holiday because in those days he used to know Billy Holiday before. Uh, Billy Holiday, he loved Rick Gordy. That, that was his favorite singer. In those days, Ella Fitzgerald was not as famous anymore. She was famous with the Chick Webb. And since Chick Webb died, her popularity went down and she sang some silly songs with some okay musicians. And one day she, she went to uh, uh, the Downbeat Club in New York, where the Zygalesby Big Band played in 1946. And okay, that's where she met Ray Brown. And uh, she came on stage, she said, can I sing a song? And she was known as singing some silly songs and some, you know, old songs. And people are saying, what she's gonna say? What she gonna sing? And Dizzy said, what do you want to sing? I want to sing anything of your bebop stuff. So they played it and she sang, she sketched like nobody else. So everybody was on the floor and said, what? She could sing that? So, Ray and Ella, you know, went on together, so they married in 1948. When Ray was booked at the Jazz at the Philharmonic in 1947, she, he already was with uh, um, Ella, and um, Ray was not happy about her rhythm section, so he fired her rhythm. That was the... Okay, I will tell you this. The day of their uh, wedding, they, wait, they married, and you know, the next day, the next morning, Ray said to Ella, we are married now. And Ella said, yeah. And Ray said, we are really married now. And Ella said, yeah, why, why are you asking me that? And he said, we are married, First thing, I will fire your trio because they are bad musicians. She was said, you can do that, you can do that. I will do that. So he took the phone and he fired the three musicians, the piano player, the bass player, and the drummer. And she said, now, what I will do? What can we do? And he said, okay. He said, I will give you the best musicians. So he called Shelly Mayne on drums and he called a piano player that she didn't heard of. And he said, okay, you will have an appointment at 2 p.m. this afternoon with this piano player. And I guarantee you that this piano player is one of the best in the world. And that was Hank Jones. See? So it began the Ray Brown trio with uh, Ray Brown, Hank Jones, backing Ella, you know, Ella and the Ray Brown trio, Hank Jones all the time at the piano, and uh, they changed drummers sometimes. They had sometimes Chetty Man, sometimes they had um, Buddy Rich, sometimes they had uh, Charlie Smith, a great drummer that nobody's talking about, but died many, many years ago, or they had Lee Young, the drummer, the, the Lester's brother. So, and then he went to Norman and he said, we have Ella Fitzgerald. 
and she can sing everything. And Norman said, oh, she sings silly songs. And he, and he said, now I want you to hear our band. And he went to the Dumbbell and he said, wow. And that's how uh, Norman Grant uh, uh, took Ella on his wings and put Ella up front again. But that was because Ray, Ray took care of her uh, musically, you know. So that's uh, another story who is related with the Norman Grants. She appears on a lot of the concerts in the 50s without being acknowledged on any of the albums or uh, a lot of the literature because, again, contractual, she was obligated to DECA. And it was when DECA's contract with her ends that Norman Grant swoops her up and creates the Verve label and creates an own series for her, the 4000 series, that was dedicated to Ella Fitzgerald and her vocal stylings. And he saw in her something that Decca didn't see. And he allows her culture to come through in the music, and she's kind of gets a new life under Norman Granz. The relationship between uh, Norman and uh, Ella was um, yeah, up and down. You know, again, um, so uh, Ella was certainly very popular. Halls, again, uh, millions of albums because of uh, Ray and, uh, you know, Norman. But Norman, again, as a dominant guy, he used to tell Ella what to sing and how to do. If she was so successful, this is in a big part of him because he said you have to sing the Gershwin book you have to sing the Borders book you have so he arranged all of that but Ella you know at the end of the 50s the beginning of the 60s she began to be a little bit tired to have every, the guy every time say you have to sing this you have to sing that you know I was um, I have a story about that and they had big arguments too. But sometimes they didn't talk to each other for three weeks, one month. You know, they play concerts, but they, they never talk together. They just watch. And you know, you can saw if they had guns, you know, both of them would be get dead, you know. <laughs> I saw that. And, and that was a, you know, until the end, you know. No man said to her, you have to preserve your voice. So you have to talk, you have to speak and sing maximum 40 minutes. You have to sing nine songs. And she said, right, okay, fine. And at the end, she sang 80 minutes, and she sang the double, you know, she sang 18 songs. So at the end of the concert, no one was really pissed off. And she said, you didn't do what I, you asked you to do. You didn't, you didn't sing the song that I asked you to sing. And I was big arguments, but they love each other. Really, they really love, but sometimes it was, you know. And Ella was, could be very rude to him too. You know, Ella was a very nice lady, but if you push her that much, she could punch you, you know, really, you know, so that you can, you know, so feel and understand that that was sometimes it was good, sometimes it was not good, you know. Uh, I have another example. Uh, Norman Grants hated Stephen Zornheim. You know, he hated, he said, this is not a composer, this is not a lyric composer, this is not a music composer. He isn't, you know. And Ella Fitzgerald, well, Ella was a huge fan of Stephen Zornheim. She never recording one song of Stephen Sondheim because Norman Grant said no. So <laughs> you can, you know, you can see, understand, you know, uh, the relation you know, between Norman, the musicians, and Ella, and you know, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, you know. But when he decided something, it was very difficult to change his mind and his uh, his thoughts. Part because of the JTP, which was touring America in the fall and the spring, starting from the end of the war into the early 50s, 
And then he starts only touring America in the fall. He starts touring Europe in the spring from like 52 or 53 to about early 60s or something like that. And then they eventually start doing some dates in Japan as well, where apparently the response was incredible. And again, Jean-Michel will share a story about that. About the jazz at the Philharmonic in, uh, in Europe, uh, they started the tours. They, they went to Europe every spring. Uh, they first they first do the spring tour in the United States and then they went to Europe spring those they started in 1952 until 59 um, then he stopped naming jazz at the Philharmonic in Europe he started to um, to promote a different way groups he stopped jam sessions really and he started to promote groups and the the, the first series was in 1960 so uh, in 1960 uh, he, when he started to promote groups you uh, you had two or three different groups of, of, for each night so in, 19, in the spring 1960 you had Stan Getz Quartet you had Oscar Peterson Trio and you had uh, Miles Davis Quintet. He was the first guy to bring Miles Davis with his group, steady group in Europe. Miles came to Europe, but he played with local musicians, or played with uh, the great René Treger, Pierre Michelot, Kenny Clark, Barney Willen, and many others. Kurt Edelagen, the great big band from Germany. But he was the first guy to bring uh, uh, Miles to Europe with his group, as he did with... Uh, uh, John Coltrane some years after and with Eric Dolphy and with a lot of people you know uh, you have to you have to know about that you know so and uh, he went to Japan the first time he went to Japan in 1953 and uh, I have a couple of um, photos and you know and the reception was huge the greatest reception that they ever had as uh, Tommy uh, Benny Carter you know, Benny said, man, I never see, never saw that in my entire life like that. You know, we were in the street, millions of people, they were applauding, sending some, you know, papers and, you know, acclaim, you know, the set up was, we were like uh, the president of the United States, you know. So that was, uh, that was fantastic because you can reflect that a couple of years before, uh, you know, the atomic bomb in the you know in Japan so but you know they, they arrived and they played great concerts but the, the you know the first European was in 1952 and 1959 and then he changed it and uh, uh, um, Norman Grants um, you know um, after that decided to uh, to move from the states to uh, to Switzerland so he lived in Lugano a few years and I, th I think in 1964 he moved to Geneva you know and he stays his main apartment was in Geneva uh, so you know he had a couple of others you know um, in Copenhagen in London and I think one in, in uh, in LA, you know, but his mainstay was uh, in uh, in uh, in Geneva. It's really hard to know where to start with this. It's such a massive, sprawling enterprise with so many great, talented names that are signature to this music. But again, this was on seventy eight initially. How high the moon? I think it was a book of like four seventy eights or something like that. And uh, side one on this is How High the Moon, which is a long jam session. And it's got some incredible talent on it uh, from Buck Clayton, from an account Basie's band, uh, Flip Phillips, who worked with Woody Herman for a long time on the tenor sax, Trummy Young's on the trombone, who had played with Jimmy Lunsford and uh, Benny Goodman, Coma Hawkins is on the tenor sax, Kenny Kersey's on the piano, who would work with, who would work with Andy Kirk for quite a while. The great Buddy Rich is on the drums. Uh, Benny Fanville's on the bass is a name I don't even know. 
And of course, another really kind of forgotten name is Willie Smith is on the alto. And he's at a lot of these uh, Jazz of the Philharmonic concerts. And I've also read that Bill Harris and Flip Phillips are on almost every one of these concerts. I think it's Flip Phillips is on every, every one from 44 in the fall all the way into the mid, uh, late 50s, I think it is. <clears throat> so this is a great title. You can find this out there. This is on the Clef series, number 608. And so you can see that the, even the verb trumpeter logo, as it's called, is a descendant of the Jazz of the Philharmonic logo. And these concerts were at first kind of mocked by the industry. Even the jazz publications were like, what's Norman doing? And the first tour had kind of an auspicious start. From what I remember reading, they went up to like Vancouver or Victoria, uh, Seattle and Portland. Um, there was issues on some tours where people would leave and quit. I believe Hank Jones does at one time. I think uh, Roy Aldridge walks off a tour at another point. Uh, but eventually he really starts to connect with these tours and he also pays these musicians really well and expects them to perform at a high capacity. Uh, I've read conflicting reports about how interfering he was in terms of what they played. Some of these liner notes say he allowed some freedom, but Jean-Michel has had the musicians tell him that uh, Norma Grants would come in and tell them what key to play what song in and demand these solo takes that have been done in one take and that's why he hired the best musicians and that's why he would record them after tours because they'd already been working with each other so they'd been a, a good company at that point. About the jazz at the Philharmonic Doors, um, they did 17 national tours from 1945 to 1957. They stopped. Norman decided to stop in the fall of 1957. At the beginning, 1945, 6, 7, 8, 9, they had two tours a year. A year, a, a tour in spring and a, a, a tour in the fall. And since 1950, until 1957, they did only one tour every year in the fall of each year. Uh, they travel all around the country, uh, Midwest, North, East, West, South, Middle. You know, they, 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 play, they play about 45, 50 concerts in the two months and a half, you know. So that was a, that was some long tours, you know, and all big halls, you know. So that was very, very, very successful, you know. And um, no man uh, used the musicians after each tour, you know. Most of the time, he recorded a couple of concerts of each tour, and at the end of each tour, he booked all the musicians for each tour to do some marathon sessions, you know. He, he booked the, the same studio for six or seven days and he recorded maybe ten albums in six or seven days, you know. So he said uh, musicians, they play together for the whole tour and after the tour they will be ready to play great, the best way together. Uh, I have a, I have a story about that. Um, coming from uh, Gates, you know, Gates was uh, Lionel Hampton's nickname in the business, and that was maybe forty years ago, maybe more, forty-five years ago. I was with Gates for a couple of concerts, and uh, one night we talk about traveling, all the problems with the, your money, your business arrangements, and uh, he 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 said he said man, the main man at that was uh, Norman Grimes. And he said, um, he said that not only traveling, not only the payroll, but everything was okay. Everything was great. So he said, um, and he, he, had a, he had a way to book musicians for the sessions. You know, he said, um, so he traveled, Lionel Hampton Gates traveled with the Jazz at the Philharmonic in 1954. 
and he recorded about 20 albums, <laughs> 20 albums in two weeks, you know, and most of them that was with Oscar Peterson, Ray Brown and Buddy Rich, and they added for a couple of sessions, Herbie Ellis, and they added for another couple of sessions, the great Buddy DeFranco, you know, and all of these albums are masterpieces, you know, uh, Lion Hampton told me that, he said to me, that was my best album I ever made in my career, so uh, you have to check if, uh, if, if you don't know those fabulous albums. So at the end of the tour, he booked musicians and he, he said to Gaze, he said, okay, be ready for tomorrow, be there at this studio, uh, we have a, a, a session, a recording session. And uh, Lionel Hampton said, uh, with who? And Norman Grant said, I don't know. Let's see what's going to happen. He knew, he knew, but he didn't want to say to anybody who was on the date, you know. So Gates told me, he said, arrive on the date. And suddenly I saw Oscar Peterson, I saw Ray Brown, and I saw Louis Belson, and I saw Johnny Hodges. Johnny Hodges was not part of the tour, but he was there. So it was a surprise. Ben Webster was not part of the, the tour, but he was there. That was a surprise. Philip, Philip Phillips, who was on each tour, you know, from 1946 to 1957, he was not there. So he changed at the last minute, you know, my grand. So everybody knew everybody. So they talked, so and so, and suddenly came Norman in the room, and he said, guys, Pay attention, please. And he said, listen, to me, you are the best musician on the planet. Okay? You are the best musician on the planet. This is why you have the best payroll on the planet. I pay you the best money on the planet. Okay? Now, you do what you want to do, but every tune, one take. And he stopped. And he went to the control booth and that was it. So they had to deal with it. You know, you knew what's going to happen. No two takes. He said, you are the best. I pay you the best. So one take. So you, you, this, is, this is a story that you can imagine hearts happen. There was a lot of stress, you know. And music, many musicians told me that he put, uh, he put on a, a lot of stress, but that was good stress. And that's how the best came out of us. You know, so you knew you have a story about how it happened in the studio. You know, it was, uh, you had to be really great musician, great gift, great, you know, to be great at your instrument to do it in one take. And, that, and that's happened like that. He said, I don't tolerate two takes, you know, but it happened. One take. So without further ado, let's kind of look at this series of the jazz, the Philharmonic, the life of Norman Grands and kind of explore some of his accomplishments and achievements. In the concerts and in the numerous recordings he releases, the statement personally supervised by Norman Granz is the good, good housekeeping seal of approval for jazz. It guarantees the product and the guarantee is re respected because of the reputation of the man. Norman Granz was the first man in the jazz field to consider the album cover first in terms of art and secondly as functional. The work of David Stone Martin, an outstanding young American artist, has graced the covers of all the Norman Grant's jazz albums, making a substantial contribution to the American art by itself. So Jean-Michel, explain to me how young Norman Grant's came upon the super talented David Stone Martin and how that relationship blossomed. Norman Grant's met David Stone Martin through Mary Lou Williams through Ash. Mary Williams met David in 1944, one day, 
and she she was amazed about his great talent and she got the idea and she said to Ash her new recording label why not to do a cover of me but a design cover and uh, Ash recording said oh yeah sure why not so she urged David Stone Martin to come to Ash and that's how uh, he did her first album on Ash Mary Williams trio 1944 1945 uh, Norman Grant met David Stone Martin and he was amazed <laughs> again by his talent and uh, Norman Grant did uh, a lot for Ash Stinson so uh, Norman asked uh, David to to do uh, a few covers for him and they finally worked together for about 25 years and uh, I think that uh, David Stone Martin did about 400 you know covers for Norman Grants for about 25 years so that's a great collaboration and it was fantastic of course <laughs> 